Hello everyone, uh, my name is Vadim and uh, today I would like to talk to you about the language that uh, I've been learning for the past year or so. Like probably everyone here, I learn languages uh, and uh, read about languages as a hobby. And personally, I think this language, the Hmong language, is a little underrepresented in language learning communities, but also surprisingly well represented on the internet for a language of its size and background. And perhaps to make uh, the language a little more understandable for more of you, I will be connecting it to the languages in its general area, the uh, mainland Southeast Asian linguistic area that more people are familiar with, like Chinese, Vietnamese, or Thai. And uh, well, first of all, uh, we need to define our terms. And uh, you've probably heard, if not about Hmong, then about uh, Miao languages or the Miao Yao or Hmong Mian language family. Um, but uh, are the terms Hmong and Miao really uh, interchangeable or not? Well, that's a bit of a tricky question because in China, where the term Miao is mainly used, it actually refers to a huge group of people and speaking a wide variety of languages in the same family. And uh, the official count of the Miao people or the Miao nationality in the latest Chinese census is 11 million people. But of course, this includes a wide variety of people groups, not all of whom speak mutually intelligible languages. And the Hmong label uh, only really applies to a subset of those people, the uh, West, the people who speak West Hmongic languages, both in and uh, outside China. And uh, the researcher Jacques Lemoine uh, calculated in 2005 that only about four to five million people in the world are can be counted in the group of Hmong who speak more or less mutually intelligible languages. And uh, within China, this roughly corresponds to the Chuanqianjing uh, cluster, of which the Dananshan variety is chosen as the standard dialect. And overall, there are three Hmongic languages that are standardized inside China. And should also be noted that outside of China, the term Miao or Mao, it's a Vietnamese variant, are actually considered to be derogatory. There's a folk etymology that it derives from the fact that the Chinese thought that the Hmongic languages sounded like cats meowing. And it may or may not be accurate, but nevertheless, this uh, perception exists that it's a derogatory term. And we should also probably qualify about the H in the beginning, because sometimes you'll see it spelled without the H. And it actually does reflect a difference in pronunciation between two main dialects that are spoken outside of China, the White Hmong and the Green Hmong. The White Hmong, in the White Hmong, the H is pronounced. I will show you how later. And in Green, green Hmong, it's uh, not pronounced. And uh, there is a surprising amount of controversy over this, whether or not either spelling fully represents the whole community. Like you can see in the lower left corner, a commemoratory stone in a park in Minnesota does not have the H in there. And this uh, caused a bit of a stir in the community. And uh, you can read about it later. I uh, put a link to the article about this. And uh, well, either way, there are uh, some compromise variant spellings, like the where the H and M are both capitalized, or the H is in brackets. But for the purposes of this presentation, we're mainly talking about the white Hmong and using the H spelling. And uh, when I talk about other variants of Hmong, I'll be uh, taking a note of that additionally. So about the origins of uh, the Hmong people and how they came to be in the area where they are now, it is believed that their ultimate origins are in the uh, Yangtze, Valley in the northern parts of what is now known as southern China. And uh, their history has been marked by a sort of pressure from the Chinese civilization to migrate further to the south and further into the mountains. And this particularly came to a head during the Qing dynasty, so starting about the 17th century, where the settlement and uh, the administrative expansion into the mountainous areas intensified. And there were several unsuccessful uprising by the Hmong people, uh, after which 
uh, large waves of migration further to the south started first into Vietnam and then into Laos, where the majority of uh, non-Chinese Hmong live nowadays. And another uh, particularly important event in the 20th century was the uh, Laotian Civil War, or the so-called Secret War, when communist and anti-communist forces battled each other with uh, Vietnamese and American involvement. And after the communists won, uh, a lot of the soldiers who were fighting against them under the leadership of uh, Van Pao, the only Hmong general in the Lao army, they and their families escaped uh, first to Thailand and uh, then to the United States. So that now there is a uh, 300,000 strong Hmong American community, mostly concentrated in Northern California and in the upper Midwest of uh, Minnesota and Wisconsin. And, uh, uh, but the vast majority of Hmong live still in the main and Southeast Asia area. And uh, for linguistic purposes, this doesn't just include the, uh, what we politically known as Southeast Asia, but also a good chunk of China. And uh, well, this area has been historically, uh, historically known uh, a lot of North-South migrations and uh, different groups of people uh, migrated down to the Indochina Peninsula in waves with, uh, for example, the Sino-Tibetan and uh, Austroasiatic groups coming a bit earlier, the Thai groups coming a bit later, and the Hmong Mian uh, groups coming the most recent, already during the period of European colonization, mainly by the French and the British. And uh, a lot of the groups that came into the area came also under Indian cultural inf influences, first through Hinduism, then uh, through Buddhism, but uh, the Hmong people came a bit uh, after that, so there's very little Indian influence in their culture. And uh, also in the area, there is a sort of divide between the lowlands and the highlands. Where in the lowlands, there are large, sprawling uh, societies that mainly subsist on growing rice. And in the mountains, there are smaller and more diverse groups that at least historically subsisted on so-called slash and burn farming. And uh, as for the mainland Southeast Asia linguistic area, well, it's uh, what's known in linguistics as a Sprachbund, uh, which is to say a group of languages that share aerial features uh, resulting from geographical proximity and language contact. So it's not really about common descent as it is about mutual influence and uh, convergence. And uh, there are some famous uh, Sprachbunds in the area, in, in the world, like, for example, the Balkan Sprachbund in uh, Southeastern Europe or the standard average European Sprachbund. And some of those are more or less uh, debatable, but the main Southeast Asian one is generally considered to be uh, quite well established. And there are several uh, language families that are listed in there that are included in it and uh, are rather uh, several branches of different families. Like, for example, for Sino-Tibetan, there is actually some debate as to whether more or less branches should be included, but the Sinitic and the Lolo-ish branches are more or less uh, uncontroversial. And before we talk more about specifically about uh, Hmong language and how it uh, resembles the other languages of the area, I'll be talking about the uh, most commonly used writing system for it, namely the Romanized popular alphabet. So actually, a lot of different writing systems have been created for Hmongic languages, and uh, this is a topic that actually deserves a presentation of its own. But for now, we'll, we'll, let's uh, just focus on the one that you're most likely to encounter on the internet, the Romanized popular alphabet. It was created in the 1950s by Christian missionaries, mainly in Laos, and as well as their uh, Hmong uh, consultants. And what are some of the... Uh, special features of this alphabet. Well, if you see the final consonants at the ends of syllables, those actually don't represent consonant sounds at all. Those are tone marks. And uh, there are seven tones in white and green mong. Uh, they're as follows, like high, pa, mi, pa, low, pa, high falling, pa, mid rising, pa, then the low creaky, pa, and the uh, falling breathy tone, pa, 
it's uh, this one's a bit tricky because the breathiness is supposed to be on the vowel, not on the consonant. Because if you say "po," that's a different syllable. So, uh, as you can see, there are no real final consonants displayed in the alphabet. The closest thing to final consonant sounds are the nasalized sounds, the "ng," "ang," and "ong" sounds, and they're displayed by putting two vowel sounds together, two of the same vowel sound together. Then all of the diphthongs in the language are falling, which is to say that I, e, I, I, A is pronounced ear, not ya, and U, A is pronounced ua, not ua. Then when an H is put before nasals, like in the name of the language itself, mong, it's a sort of devoiced nasal sound. If you've learned uh, Icelandic or Welsh, you might be familiar with what that sounds like. And when the H is put after a consonant, that just uh, represents aspiration, like p, t, k. When there's a Y, it's uh, palatalization. And when you place the N before a consonant, it's uh, pre-nasalization. So its actual pronunciation varies depending on which consonant comes after it. And so uh, for the phonological structure in the mainland Southeast Asia linguistic area, there are uh, certain common features like for instance, that the morphemes tend to be monosyllabic or consisting only of one syllable. And even if some of the languages historically had more than one syllable per morpheme, they, they tend to merge into this uh, one syllable pattern. And uh, also in terms of the syllable structure, uh, the languages tend to have very large consonant inventories, as we have seen on the previous slide, and uh, many different file contrast as well. And there's a bit of a variance inside the area. So if we go further to the south, the fewer simple consonants and uh, more vowels and vice versa, if we go to the north, like for comparison, here's a, in the table of central Khmer, which is a typical uh, southern representative with just 17 initial consonants, although that's not counting uh, consonant clusters, and uh, nine simple vowels, which is more than in the three monic varieties below, and also 13 final consonants. And uh, as we said, the, the monic languages only really have one final consonant equivalent. And uh, another striking feature in the area is, well, first of all, that all of the well, a lot of the languages in there are tonal, but also that the tonality in those languages originated in a very similar two-stage process, uh, where in the first stage, the, depending on how a syllable ended, uh, those uh, whether it ended in an open syllable or um, in globalization or a s or h sound or in uh, a stop consonant, when those differences started to disappear, they were replaced by three or four tones, usually a level tone, a rising tone, and a falling tone, and maybe an abrupt tone where the stop consonants used to be. And in the second stage, uh, the initial consonants of the syllables affect the tones usually with usually the voiced uh, consonants making the tone lower, thus splitting the four or three first stage tones into eight or six second stage tones. Uh, and now uh, not all of the languages that exist now actually have all eight tones because they sometimes merged with each other. But nevertheless, you can reconstruct by looking at related languages and including related languages that don't have tones and uh, uh, reconstruct this two-stage process. And uh, it's not just possible to reconstruct it, it's also attested in linguistic literature, for example, about uh, Middle Chinese four tones, which are extensively written about in contemporary literature and then can still be traced to the modern tones in modern Chinese varieties, as well as the uh, tone marks in the Thai languages, where they represent the first stage tones. And in order to get the modern tones, you need to look, among other things, on the uh, consonant and which group it belongs to. And in the Hmong languages, a similar process has been reconstructed, both by looking at related languages, and uh, including those that are uh, not tonal as of now. And uh, you can also see traces of that by looking at certain consonants, like, for instance, the uh, voiceless nasals. If you look in a dictionary at the syllables that start with those consonants, they only happen in 
tone one, uh, category one tone syllables, which is to say that historically have been voiceless. And uh, a lot of those uh, Hmong varieties have preserved a lot of those uh, tonal constructs. For example, the Danan Shan, which is standard in China, has preserved all eight constructs, whereas white Hmong and green Hmong have uh, merged at least uh, one of the tones with another, and uh, it's a different one for each of them. Now, this might seem like a bit of an abstract and uh, useless bit of knowledge, but there is at least one practical application for it when learning Hmong, which is to uh, determine the rules for the tone santi. Uh, tone santi is when two syllables uh, two adjacent syllables affect each other's tone. Perhaps the most famous example is uh, in Mandarin, where two third tones next to each other become a second and a third tone. But unlike in Mandarin, in modern Hmong, those aren't uh, automatic processes. They are mostly preserved in fixed expressions and in certain contexts. But nevertheless, they are common enough to be taught in learning materials. And uh, as you can see here, there are uh, pages from a textbook where this process is presented as a little bit arbitrary. So it says that there are two uh, trigger tones and then the tones that follow them trans transform into other ones like uh, this way and this way and this way. However, if we look at what historical categories those tones were, we can see a certain pattern emerging. For example, that the two trigger tones were historically open syllable uh, tones. So uh, category A tones. And uh, for the other tones, the, whether they belong to historically voiced or historically voiceless, the uh, different rules apply for uh, category one tones, which is historically voiceless. They sort of shift down the list. So B1 to C1 and then C1 to D1. And uh, category two tones or historically voiced, they all merge into one tone, the C2 tone. And uh, the B2C2 shift doesn't happen in Green Mong because those tones are already merged in there to begin with. And uh, for the morphological structure of the mainland Southeast Asian languages, uh, also a lot of common patterns emerge. For example, that the languages turn, tend to be isolating. Uh, so the numbers of morphemes per word is close to one. Now, this isn't to say that multi-morpheme or multi-syllable words don't exist. It's just that the general rule is that uh, there tends to be one word, uh, one morpheme per, per word. And also, they tend to have an analytic structure, which is to say that morphemes do not get modified by affixes or internal changes. So there's no conjugation, no declension no prefixes or suffixes, just morphemes being strung together. And uh, you can see in the example sentence that usually one syllable, one word, one meaning. So one morpheme per word. And uh, another common feature for the languages is that modifiers tend to be tend to go after the modified word. This is not the case in most Chinese languages, but it is the case in Vietnamese and in Thai and in Khmer. So, for example, the adjectives go after the nouns. And you can see in the example sentence too, the adjective big or lo uh, is after house or che. And uh, another common feature is that nouns and verbs can also act as grammatical markers. So in addition to their literal meaning, they also have a grammaticalized meaning. Like on the right hand side, you can see the verb tau, which uh, literally means to achieve or to obtain, also has at least two grammaticalized meanings. When it's placed before the verb, it uh, marks the perfective aspect. So I have tried, for example. And uh, if it's placed after the verb, it means to be able to or to, uh, can do something. So I can try. And for a noun example, is uh, the noun ke which uh, literally means way or road, but can also mean uh, be used to turn verbs or adjectives into nouns. So like ke mo, the uh, way of sickness is, well, sickness or to, uh, illness, and ke tua, the uh, way of dying, so death. And another very common feature in the area is the use of numerical classifiers or so counter words. So basically, this means that by default, the nouns are 
uh, uncountable. And in order to make them countable, you need to add counter words, which is similar to, for example, the English uh, a sheet of paper or two heads of cattle. And these uh, counter words or classifiers are usually come in different varieties based on, for example, the shape of the noun they refer to or whether it's living or not. And also, similarly to Cantonese, the uh, classifiers can also be used in Hmong as, uh, as uh, articles, as both uh, indefinite or definite article, depending on whether there's a numeral one placed before them. Like in the examples, you can see one plus the flat object counter in the word for paper means a sheet of paper. But if you put the counter for written messages, cha, uh, without any numeral, so it becomes the letter. And uh, finally, the similarities in the syntactic structures of the languages. Well, the most basic one is that there tends to be the subject verb object word order, the same as in English. And in the example sentence, you can see there's the exact same word order as in English, I ate rice. And also a common feature is the so-called topic comment uh, sentence structure. And uh, here, we actually see a similarity not just to, uh, for example, Chinese or Thai, but also to uh, Japanese and Korean, where the there's actually a separate topic mark marking particle. Like here, it's used to uh, ask a question about an action that the person you're talking to is performing. Like, you plant rice, you do it close together or uh, more thinly. And uh, finally, another very common feature is the uh, sentence final particle that adds some emotional uh, aspect to a sentence or like uh, a sort of conversational aspect, like, for example, the uh, particle law, which is used to ask uh, uh, tag questions or rhetorical questions. But this phrase in particular, like uh, it's uh, an example that's uh, as a sort of a greeting, actually, like if you see a person, you know, who's uh, in, engaged in some action, like a way to start the conversation is just, oh, you're, you're, doing, you're doing that, day. you're sleeping your house or you're washing your dishes. And another particle is na, which is a sort of uh, inviting or um, uh, uh, asking for a certain action, like here, for example, pay mu na, like, come on, let's go. And uh, finally, here's a few more unusual features, particular to Hmong, which aren't necessarily exclusive to Hmong, but nevertheless, they aren't really included in uh, the common features of the area, but I thought they were worth mentioning. Like, uh, as we can tell, the, there are no, no uh, noun numbers in Hmong, but for personal pronouns, not only is there a singular and plural, there's also a dual, like in some Indo-European languages. However, this has not been preserved in all Hmongic languages. For example, the standard Chinese uh, Tan and Shan dialect does not have them. And uh, another feature is uh, the uh, serial verb constructions, where verbs with uh, similar or uh, overlapping meanings are just strung one after another for a more complex a description of action like here for instance we have go look for ask visit see and it's basically telling to perform everything that is needed to in order to find some people and uh, finally the uh, spatial deictics which is uh, to say uh, particles that refer to spatial relations between objects and in Hmong in particular a lot of them are uh, spe specifically fitted to a mountainous area with uh, mountains and valleys and rivers. And uh, so, for example, a lot of the time, instead of saying, like, I'm at someone's house, they say, I'm down at someone's house, like if it's a house downhill, or I'm across at someone's house where it's across a valley or a river. And this is so deeply ingrained in the language that even Hmong Americans or refugees who arrived in America in the completely flat Midwest, so kept using it, but transforming their meaning slightly. So like, for example, here we have Nda, which is downhill, but here it's used to refer to the South, like uh, literally down South. And uh, well, 
I hope this uh, gave you a little taste for the Hmong language. And here are the sources that I used in the preparation of my presentation, including both uh, papers, books, and uh, uh, lectures. And uh, for a few, a bit more information about uh, the Hmong language, Hmong culture, I would like to recommend the following. Uh, first, the website studyhmong.com, which is uh, well, a website dedicated to studying. There are uh, textbooks, uh, dictionaries, uh, grammar books, uh, books about the history and the culture of the monks. So it's basically the main resource I use to study. And uh, some of the books that I cited for this presentation were from there. Then uh, there's a lot of inf information about Hmong and in Hmong in, on the YouTube. And uh, among them, I would like to recommend the documentary Hmong Mountains, which is by an Hmong American filmmaker Neng Tao, where he uh, explores his own connections to the Hmong culture, and specifically the musical culture, and uh, a particular style of music where actual spoken words of the language are encoded in the tones and the harmonies. Then you might have heard of the movie Gran Torino by and starring Clint Eastwood, which uh, features the Hmong American community very heavily and their socioeconomic issues and uh, socioeconomic situation. And a lot of that has actually been written about uh, all the uh, inaccuracies in portraying the Hmong culture in this movie. But nevertheless, it's a mainstream Hollywood film with quite a lot of Hmong dialogue. And then next is uh, Reads, which is a uh, fantasy webcomic, also by a Hmong American author, which is heavily based on Hmong culture and mythology. And uh, next is a book, a very famous case study in uh, healthcare and uh, intercultural communication and healthcare, The Spirit Catches You and You Fall Down by Anne Fadiman, which is based on a real case where the cultural miscommunication between the healthcare system and uh, a Hmong refugee family resulted in tragedy. And uh, moving, stepping back a little from the Hmong in particular, I can't recommend enough uh, Stuart G. Rogers' YouTube channel for people who are perhaps interested in the uh, connections between the languages in Southeast Asia. He talks a lot about the similarities in their tonal systems, in their uh, grammars in their consonant systems, in their writing systems, and this video in particular, that uh, whose um, thumbnail I put in there, is uh, actually been one of the inspirations for this presentation. And finally, uh, also not specifically about the Hmong, but about the uh, Highland Southeast Asian areas, the art of not being governed by James C. Scott, which uh, talks about their societal structures and how they have uh, resisted state control uh, for a very long time. So anyway, uh, thank you for your attention, or watch out, as they say in Hmong. And uh, this is it for my presentation for now. Well, if there are no questions for now, I would just like to uh, mention one thing I had in my presentation before, but uh, decided to exclude at the last moment. Uh, as you can see, the Hmong Mian family uh, consists of two branches, and the other branch, Mian or Yao, as it's called in China, it's, uh, as you can probably tell, a little bit further from Hmong than the Hmongic languages. And uh, also culturally, the uh, Mian people are uh, a lot more synthesized or assimilated into Chinese culture than uh, Hmongic peoples. So they, in fact, they're even uh, adopted Taoism as their folk religion. And in terms of their uh, linguistic differences from Hmongic, they've preserved more final consonants, but fewer initial consonants. So it also uh, it reflects the splits in the overall area, the uh, north and south splits. Is there many differences with white Hmong languages? Um, I'm not sure what this means. Uh, like within the white Hmong, it's uh, well, 
at the same time, there's surprisingly little variation, but also there are variations mainly uh, based on the country, because in China, obviously, the white Hmong that remain in China have uh, undertaken influences from Chinese, from the standard Dan and Shan dialect. And in Laos, they've uh, borrowed a lot of Lao words. And obviously, in the US, there's a lot of English words. But in general, there's still quite a lot of uh, mutual uh, comprehensibility between them. Now, uh, some more questions. Uh, what variety of Hmong is most common in the US? It's the white Hmong. I don't have the exact numbers, but it's believed to be uh, roughly 40 to, 60, 40 to 60 split between the green Hmong and the white Hmong. And because of this, slight numerical superiority is why a lot of the time the term Hmong refers to white Hmong exclusively and uh, most of the learning materials are for white Hmong. But there's actually quite a lot of mutual comprehensibility between the two varieties. It's been compared to the differences between the US and the UK variants of English. And is the Hmong generally spoken in the US different from the one spoken by communities in Europe? Now, I am not sure if uh, there are significant communities in Europe to significant enough to have uh, any specific varieties of their own. I know that in France in particular, there, there are at least two communities living in French Guiana in South America, and uh, I think they speak uh, green Hmong. But uh, I'm afraid I don't know beyond that if there are any linguistic differences between them. So, would you recommend Hmong as an introduction to tonal languages? Because I've never studied a tonal language before. Uh, this is a tricky question. Uh, I'd say maybe if you're not interested in Hmong specifically, that it might be easier to start elsewhere, because uh, if you're listening to tonal languages for the first time, uh, you need to listen a lot and while there's a lot of media in Hmong there's not so much uh, audio specifically for learners and uh, a lot of that exists actually is a bit low quality and uh, well if you do study Hmong your best bet is probably uh, learning materials on YouTube that are aimed at Hmong children who live in the diaspora because a lot of them do focus on the tones and the differences of them and go into great detail about it. Uh, but in general, other tonal languages like Chinese or Vietnamese have uh, a lot more resources for that. And uh, which script has been used before or besides the Roman script? Oh, well, yeah, like I said, it's a very huge topic and uh, there are different uh, Roman uh, variants of the Roman alphabet that are used for Hmong and uh, now it's not known exactly uh, whether or not uh, the Hmong had a writing system before the 20th century or the late 19th century there are, uh, the community does uh, believe that they had a writing system at some point and at least some Chinese sources mention it but historical uh, historians are a bit skeptical about this and perhaps the most famous non-Roman uh, script is the so-called Paha of Hmong, which uh, was created by a Hmong person independently of or not knowing any other scripts, which uh, is sort of similar to, uh, if you know in Chinese, the uh, Bopomofo. So it's a feature of alphabet that consists of letters that represent uh, initials and finals and tones. And uh, it still has some use in Laos primarily, but uh, in the rest of the community, a lot more people seem to be um, proud of its existence more than actually familiar and able to use it. And uh, what got you interested in studying Hmong? Uh, do you speak another Southeast Asian language? Uh, well, it's a bit of a uh, weird maybe story. I've, uh, I have tried studying Vietnamese and Thai before, but didn't really get far. 
but and I did have Hmong on my radar for some time. But what really um, spurred me on is uh, the discovery of uh, a YouTube creator, a, a virtual YouTuber, a VTuber called uh, Finan Ryugu, who is played by a Hmong American person. And uh, she mentioned her ancestry uh, in one of her earlier streams and how she spoke that language as a child, but uh, can't really speak it now. And uh, I, well, first of all, I do like her content, but I also found it relatable how a, a immigrant community that perhaps immigrated not entirely uh, voluntarily uh, is slowly losing it, its community language because I have uh, uh, Soviet Korean or Koryo Saram ancestry and uh, we also are uh, losing our language after uh, being exiled from our original place of residence. So I found this relatable and uh, tried to find if there were any resources to learn this language and so here I am basically. Well, if there are no other questions, then I guess we can wrap up. Thank you very much for your attention. And uh, I'll be sure to add some contact information in my profile if you want to ask for this uh, presentation. But if not, uh, I think this presentation is going to be uploaded on uh, YouTube later. So there's always that. Thank you very much. And uh, have a good rest of the event.